let's see. Okay, I'm going to start. Uh, the mantra, gate, gate, paragate, parasam, gate, bodhisvaha, that concludes the Heart Sutra is often left untranslated. Though having this ending to an otherwise logical sutra can seem puzzling, each word has a definite meaning. Gate is the past participle of the Sanskrit for no, for go, and so means gone. Para is beyond, and parasam is all the way beyond. Bodhi is enlightenment, as in the Bodhisattva, enlightened being. And svaha, which also appears at the end of Hindu incantations, if translatable, could be all hail, or at last, or even hallelujah. This makes the mantra gone, 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 gone beyond, gone all the way beyond, hail enlightenment. It turns out, according to the Dalai Lama in his Essence of the Heart Sutra, that the mantra summarizes the content of the sutra. In the version used by uh, Zen Buddhists, the Bodhisattva starts out with the Bodhisattva of Lukiteshvara, having seen in deep samadhi that all five skandhas are empty and thus relieved all suffering, is asked by the Buddha to explain to the smartest of his disciples, Shariputra, how this was come to. Why the past participle is used seems related to Avalokitesvara going backwards and what was gone through in practice. The Dalai Lama translation of the mantra adopts instead the present tense of the verb go, so that the mantra becomes go, go, go beyond, go all the way beyond, enlightenment, yeah. This makes the mantra a guide to where practice will take us. Avalokiteshvara begins explaining how suffering is, is eliminated through an analysis of various relationships between form and emptiness. The first go represents form as emptiness. Zen Buddhists begin to practice by meditating, <coughs> but concurrently also may start to put their ordinary <coughs> life in order by taking the precepts. Traditionally, this was said to be to gain merit through stopping further creation of karma. This go thus refers to going from form towards emptiness through the use of sitting and careful living. However, this understanding of emptiness is basically intellectual. The second go, instead, is about proceeding towards actually realizing in, in light, uh, emptiness by being aware of our mind moment after moment. This state is represented by emptiness as form. Dogen Zenji's to study Buddhism is to study the self, to study the self is to forget the self, seems to correspond to these first two goes. To study the self is to, to study Buddhism is to study the self, which is, would, would be the first go, is to apply Buddhism, study the self, to our lives by taking on the study of the self, not Buddhism, through meditating and through keeping the precepts. To study the self is to forget the self, on the other hand, is to prepare for experiencing emptiness through looking clearly at ourselves within the world. Then, any small event, such as classically hearing the sound of wind through bamboo, could lead to our forgetting that self and recognizing who we really are. This is the third stage, go beyond, the state of emptiness is emptiness. The Heart Sutra intro introduces this state next with all dharmas are marked with emptiness. Uh, and then you, you can see that there. Okay. This passage presents bodhisattvas going from this shore to the other shore. 
This does not mean an end to their practice, however. In the subsequent section, in the Heart Sutra begins with, it follows from emptiness that there is no, and proceeds to negate everything that the Buddha originally taught, thus nullifying the teachings that practice has been based on until now. Such a denial is uh, analogous to taking off the training wheels in a bike, bicycle, once a child knows how to ride, or to removing the scaffolding around a building once construction is done. Another oft-mentioned metaphor is that of not needing a boat anymore after crossing over to enlightenment. This negation by the Heart Sutra is followed by with nothing to attain, the Bodhisattva relies on Prajnaparamita, which I've spoken about recently. The perfection of Prajna, the innate wisdom beyond thought, that is the faceless face of enlightenment. Because prajna is dependent on, continue, continues the sutra, the, and I've added here, discursive, end of adding, mind is no hindrance, as it lacks the self-centered thoughts that daily hound us, that daily hound us. Moreover, no fears exist Neg negative thoughts being what emotions such as fear come from. And when we cease to believe in our thoughts, the fears that start out in them lose their power over us as well. Are there any questions by now? I will go on. The sutra continues, far from every inverted view, one dwells in nirvana. Humans put the cart before the poor horse in trying to fit what they perceive into their individual, habitual ways of seeing things. The result is that mistaken views get in the way of our being with what is right in front of us. Beyond every inverted view is referring to how our dependence on thoughts and those groups of thoughts termed views gets in the way. The barriers that views put up keep us from being with things as they really are. Thinking may be our main tool for enduring our, for ensuring our survival, but a tool doesn't define us. Needing a hammer to drive nails doesn't mean that we should honor hammers. Even the Dharma is a toolbox for a practice based on the ideas of Shakyamuni. The phrase, inverted view, comes from Tendo Muso in Sino-Japanese. Mu is dream, and so is thought. Therefore, dream thought, if not daydream. Musso is then our dreamlike understanding of ourselves and the world. Tendo means upside down, translated here as inverted. This was once rendered perverted, and despite the modern meaning this has, we are indeed perverted in believing that we are what we think we are. Thus, inverted views are those predetermined chunks of thought that are the opposite of the truth. Because of them, we get things backward. When we give up on the primacy of thought and our packaged, prepackaged, prejudiced views, we will no longer believe in the repository of our thoughts as being ourselves and will thus be far beyond every inverted view. I'm not sure what Descartes intended to say by cognito ergo sum, which is word by word, think, therefore am, 
But in English, this becomes, I think, therefore I am. However, a Buddhist might say as well, if it makes sense in Latin, sum, sum ergo cognito, that is, am, therefore think, or I am, therefore I think, as we have thoughts because we are living, not the other way around. Either way, I think, therefore I am, or I am, therefore I think, would be better without the two I's in it that it gets from being in English. I is a single letter representing a complete, if mistaken, worldview. Neither the ams or the thinks in am, therefore think, or in think, therefore am, would miss the unnecessary eyes. They are something extra. Such a belief in intrinsic self that I expresses is an artifact made of thought. We needn't, shouldn't, and cannot <coughs> give up thinking, of course, but the fact that we think doesn't mean that we have to believe in everything that thinking comes up with. Vaulted def definitions such as that of the selfish self don't have to be lived by. It follows that when we fully experience how our inverted views lead to suffering and therein give up our belief in them is when they will cease to influence us. Only then will we dwell in nirvana. From it follows with emptiness to it dwells in nirvana is the state of go all the way beyond. In it, our awareness of emptiness during meditation has also extended to include that of the entire world at the same time that we have also gradually come back to the world of form. It is thus both emptiness is emptiness and form is form. As we go back and forth between being fully in samadhi during our meditation and fully in daily life. However, the Heart Sutra does not specifically deal with form as form. Rather, if everything, Dharma included, is empty, then in the end, emptiness itself is empty, just as form already is empty, which is to say, all, distinguish, all, distinct, all distinctions, such as form as emptiness, disappear. There is no form, and there is no emptiness either. Anyway, that is to go all the way beyond. Where does that leave us? Here. Nothing is left but here. These statements of freedom from desire and anger or fear and from preconceptions are followed by in the three worlds of past, present, and future, all the Buddhas, who, by the way, were Bodhisattvas before, right up until this point, depend on Prajnaparamita, the perfection of wisdom, thereby attaining, as you're reading now, unsurpassed, complete, perfect enlightenment, which is Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi. From here, the sutra introduces the Prajnaparamita mantra, praising it for being transcendent, bright, supreme, and incomparable in that it removes all suffering. And it then provide, provides us the mantra, this go, go, go beyond, go all the way beyond, as well as being an easy to remember summary of form is emptiness, Emptiness is form, emptiness is emptiness, and form is form, also captures our life in practice and our practice in life. Both the sutra and the mantra end with bodhisvaha, enlightenment, hail enlightenment, or enlightenment yeah, or enlightenment wow. Such final enlightenment is beyond, as we've just seen, all discrimination, or 
lack of discrimination for that matter. The profane and the holy are not different from one another in, Buddha, in, in Buddhahood. This fifth state, in which no separation remains between form and emptiness, is fittingly, without a gate, go in it. So remember, it goes gate, go, gate, go, uh, Gate, gate, para, para, gate, go, all, go beyond, and then para sam gate, go all the way beyond. That's where gate ends. There's no more going. There is just being. This anyway. So I'll give it back. So this state in which no separation, as I just said, between form and em emptiness is fittingly without a gate go in it, and even seems to bear resemblance to our lives prior to the opportunity that Buddhism gave us to, Buddhism gave us to differentiate dharma, such as form from emptiness, as emptiness from form. It is though we have come full circle. This is what is symbolized by the front of the enso. You know the enso, right? The, the dharma circle we often see. So they, here's the circle, begins here, goes around, comes back, starts right down here. You you you, you hit the brush strongly to the to the paper, and then you go. Looks like you're making one curve, but actually one of our teachers taught us that you actually make little little teeny motions, so that every part of the brush is discreet as it goes around. So here. When form is where we're form we're in form going around to the top, which is form is emptiness. This is going from emptiness from form to emptiness, but making very 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 little teeny teeny strokes, and then you come back down again, and then you come around again, and by that time most of the ink has gone, and so therefore, but you go but you sometimes it's one full circle. But often it's like this, goes up, goes up, goes down, and then it kind of it peters out, as it were, right at the end. This is, returning, returning here, this is what is symbolized by the front of the Enso, meaning the back of itself. This represents that while beginners can be weighed down with delusions, unencumbered Buddhas are open to everything. But if you look at them, you can't tell the difference. Dogen wrote of the latter, of the Buddhas, no trace of enlightenment remains. And this no trace continues forever. Well, I got it finished today. <laughs> you have well, probably not much time left. And we have, but are there any questions? Yes, Bhakti. Uh, you said form is empty. Oh, well, there's a good question. <laughs> there's a good question. Um, because they become indistinguishable. However, I do not pretend that I understand that. In fact, I cannot. I, so therefore, that's, that's why it was a very good question. Because okay. we, always, we, always keep, keep, we always keep keeping practicing. And we think it's very helpful to think that we're getting somewhere. But you know, all we're doing is moving these increments. Whether we're here, or over here, or down here, it doesn't matter. It's being on the path that matters. Where you get to on the path, doesn't matter. Because when you get there all the way, the beginning and the end are the same. You're just living your life. But you no longer have to have a, a pattern called the Dharma to live your life. You just live your life. So Dalai Lama calls that, that, that stage no more teaching. No more receiving the teaching. No more dependence on the teaching. That's what the scaffolding metaphor or the, or the, or the or training, training wheels metaphor is. Just 
put yourself out of business, huh? Uh, <laughs> no, because uh, because it's of those not one second here, uh, because even because actually, the Dharma is not of use to you anymore, but it's of use to others. So then you you are you are not stuck with you're not stuck in the Dharma. Once again, I'm speaking from supposition, because I'm rather stuck in the Dharma. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, I wouldn't be writing about these things. <laughs> uh, oh, John, John is next. John. Well, I was just trying to find, while you are talking, I was trying to find the intercon, because this is sometimes a confusing thing. So, like you were just talking about, so once, you know, gone, 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 so that's the point at which the scaffolding is no longer needed. But... At the same time, there's a, a place in the Genja Cohen, I believe, where Dogen talks about how even once you've reached, I don't know if that's the point he's talking about, but it seems it's the point he's talking about, he, he then goes on to say that you, you, can, you get right back at it. You never, you never stop the practice. Yeah, that's why, that's right. Th therefore, no trace of enlightenment re remains. That's what it means, you know. I just always get confused by this because it, there is there there is a point at which I feel like the scaffolding um, we become too attached to the scaffolding. Exactly, and that and you give it up. That's right, give up the scaffolding. That's right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's what. Of course, the end of the Genjo Cohen there is the is the one about uh, um, uh, no trace of enlightenment remains. On the last day of his life, um, Robert Aiken, you know, Robert Aiken, of course, some some other person from Soto Zen uh, went to visit him. Uh, as he, he was a student, and he, he, he didn't know it was his last day, of course. The student didn't think so. And they talked together. And, and in passing, uh, uh, Robert Aiken said, you know, uh, you, you, know you, yeah, you can't even remember my enlightenment experience anymore. And the person who wrote about it kind of took it in a funny way. But in fact, he was expressing that, perhaps. Hmm. Yeah. It just uh, seems that sometimes it's, it's difficult to know um, when there's too much attachment to the scaffold. Well, exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's, what, that's, that's exactly what is being, is, was being denied when, when we went in the, in, in the main part of this, where I didn't read it today, but where it says, uh, uh, you know, no eyes, no ears, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, all that is, is, is doing that, is giving away the Dharma. Yeah, I mean, I know there are whole sects of Buddhism, of Zen Buddhism, of other types of Buddhism that have tried to strip away the majority of the, I, don't know, I guess you call it the, I don't know what you call it, but of the majority of Buddhism and leaving it with, Really, just the um, being on the cushion, you know, and losing the the the, the, the figuratives of Buddha, and, you know, like there's that uh, Korean sect that's called Wan, where the only thing in their their zendos in their temples are the um, I just lost the name the end the Anza. the Anza is it? Um, so it's just a it's just a question it just. I feel like it's some. You no, know, it's it's you know, it's I'm more sorry. a question of. I'm gonna. Say, it's more a question of how kind are you to the to the your to your to the people that you're trying to help. So you can be really strict and say, never, 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 it's not necessary to pound them, to beat them up every day. So, uh, so it's it's the, the Buddha's kindness to have given us the Dharma. So uh, you can there are, there are many ways of seeing it. They kind of have to come down to personal personal qual personal attributes. Uh, uh, the the your, your your society's attributes. People make their own version of the Dharma to fit their, don't make it, but the Dharma t changes its face as it goes within a new, with, it goes within new, new people. Clearly, I mean, like, I'm, like wh what we practice is 
very, I mean, obviously, Western Zen. It's yeah, well, we're, very different we're, we're, we're practicing Suzuki Roshi Zen, who came from, from, a, from a Buddhist scholar, and we, and, and we trace back, but Suzuki Roshi said, Buddhism, America must change Buddhism. Not for the Buddhist sake, but Buddhism, you're going to have a different kind of practice. But you can't plan for that. So sometimes I'm a little, it, this is a little bit of what I'm trying to get at, is that the Dharma is everything. It's not just the teachings. It's, that's another word for it. But it's beyond that. The Dharma really is, is everything. It's emptiness is emptiness. Well, of course, Dharma means things, right? Yes. So, my point being that um, is there really ever any real way to give up the scaffolding if we're immersed in the scaffolding at all times? Apparently, and let's put a capital A on that, apparently there is. Yeah, Someone has another hand? Yes. yes. Um, far beyond every inverted view. Inverted, is it our... our Dualistic thought? No, in this case, you know, I, I, my, I have another talk I'm, I want to do some research on to give. But I, th I think it's talking about the, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, let me see what I make. My, my, oh, yeah, oh, anyway, it's talking, uh, the, uh, it's talking, I think it's talking about the fourth skanda. You know, there's the five skandhas. It says, well, he says that all five skandhas are empty. Uh, and thus, and thus, relieved all suffering, because the skandhas are empty, right? But, 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 but the skandhas are well, things and our and the actual organ itself, and then, then from there on, the the use that our brain makes of the organ, uh, which is, it, it perceive it. There is a sensation. It recognizes that there's a a, a, a sensation, and then it, uh, and then it, and then it perceives, kind of adding in a little more mental functions. And the third one is also called, is, is hard to say, here it's called formations, I think, formation, uh, but it's many, many translations of it. But, it. but it means the patterns, that, the thought patterns that we've latched onto to create reality. Uh, and, uh, and a good way to, and, uh, and so they're prejudgments. And then we live by those prejudgments. So therefore, we live by this code that is unreal as anything else, just as more than I used, I, in the talk I said, thoughts or groups of thoughts that make up, that make up views. And, and of course, that's what happens. We, we really are, we really are prejudiced, but not in the sense of the, of the modern sense of, of, of racially or socially being prejudiced. We, we, we prejudge, so we don't think, we don't see what, what reality is, because we live by our judgments. And I think that's so there. So they've got things upside down. What this means, there, it's 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 the exact opposite. We should live without those. So that is delusion we're living in. Well, that's that's one part of delusion. Yeah. So inverted view isn't another word for delusion. It's a little different. It's I think so. Yeah. I, that's that's delusion. that's my that's my guess at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's uh, that 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 it means. Uh, 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 patterns of thought, but but they're specific to a lot of things in our you know what's good and what's bad. However, it's you know good and bad are patterns of thought. So when Buddhism says go on good and bad, that's what it means. It means go on go beyond patterns, concepts. Go beyond concepts, of, of which Buddha Dharma is one. Yeah, um, I was gonna say um, if we're not our thoughts, if we're not our feelings, what are we? Then? I'm looking at it. <laughs> no, no. All these things are what you're giving up is attachment to concepts, not not reality. Reality stays the same. You touch, but 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 in certain things we've made a mistake on how we've codified, as it were, reality. And also because it wasn't mentioned in the talk today very much. But you know, it's it's because of uh, here it says it gives up. You know, if if there's, if there's if there's no place to go, nothing to attain means there's no dharma to attain. In this case, in this sutra, there's no. And then, then that's when when prajna kicks in, as it were, right? 
And that's separate from all those things. That's the real tr truth of how we live. We ultimately live by, by prajna, not, not by every, everything else. I just want to say also that um, a lot of times uh, I feel like, like when you even asked the, ask the question, you said our thoughts, mm -hmm. our feelings, mm -hmm. and oftentimes people say my thoughts, mm -hmm. my mm -hmm. feelings. Well, they therefore belong to you, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's, a, that's the way you've codified it, right. even in your head. Mm -hmm. So they are not you, mm -hmm. right? They're, you've even codified it in your head that these belong to me. They belong to you, they are not you. So. Therefore, innately, you are outside of them. And you can clearly see them, and you are not your thoughts, because if you have a thought, I want to go kill somebody, is that you? I hope not. <laughs> if, you have, not if, if you're not. depressed, if you, you're, you're having depressed feelings. You are not depressed. You are having depressed feelings that you are reacting to. You're having thoughts you are, you are reacting to, but you are not them. That's what I think. Daniel? <laughs> but why don't you? <laughs> I've done it to you again. <laughs> I've done it to you again. <laughs> no, give us a capping phrase here. I have no idea. Okay, there we go. Everybody, that's it for today, huh? <laughs>